I was watching Fox News this morning and I decided to create this um, index of the Fox News Sunday program today. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of Iraq, where it is now, what the government should do, how he got into it. And I think it's important that uh, people have a perspective, uh, maybe that they don't ordinarily hear. And I, I often, often hear uh, Fox News um, denigrated for biased coverage and so on. So I, I invite you to take a look at this program. And what I've done to make it easier over here is to uh, create a, a clickable index of the program, so you can go right to right to various sections. Hopefully, that'll make it uh, easier and more enjoyable to listen to. So, I, I hope this is useful to you. New Sunday, and hello again from Fox News in Washington. President Obama says the campaign of airstrikes and humanitarian airdrops he ordered this week is, quote, a long-term project that could go on for months. But he maintains there are strict limits to our involvement in Iraq. Today, we want to analyze the U.S. combat mission in depth. Retired four-star General Jack Keane will lay out the battlefield. We'll hear from two leading senators. But first, senior White House foreign affairs correspondent Wendell Gohler has the latest developments. Wendell. Chris, the president says there are several objectives in the Iraq campaign, and not all of them are under the control of the U.S. and its allies. The first is to defend the U.S. consulate in Erbil, where there are several hundred Marines, and to stop the attacks on refugees on Sinjar Mountain. The U.S. has conducted a number of airstrikes on ISIS forces, artillery pieces, that have been firing at civilians. Mr. Obama says the military is confident it can protect the refugees, but soon enough, and likely with the help of Iraqi and Kurdish forces, they'll have to form a corridor to get tens of thousands of refugees safely off the mountain. The next step, which is going to be complicated logistically, is how do we give safe passage for people down from the mountain uh, and where can we uh, ultimately relocate them uh, so that uh, they are safe. That's the kind of coordination that we need to do internationally. The president spoke with the leaders of Germany, France and Britain about joining the effort to deliver food and water to the trapped refugees, though probably not joining the fighting. Meanwhile, he suggests, though he doesn't say so openly, Iraqi President Nouri al-Maliki needs to give up his quest for another term. Mr. Obama blames Maliki's bias against Sunnis and Kurds for fueling the ISIS rebellion. He says Iraq has made progress naming a Kurdish president and a Sunni speaker of parliament, but it will need a government all Iraqis can buy into to stop driving the Sunnis to join the ISIS forces to get them to help defeat them. Chris? Wendell Goler traveling with the president in Martha's Vineyard. Wendell, thanks for that. Joining us now at the map to break down the military situation in Iraq is retired four-star Army General and Fox News military analyst Jack King. General, as you sit there tonight, show us what ISIS's position is right now from in northern Iraq, from Mount Sinjar in the west to the Mosul Dam, uh, all the way over to Erbil in the east. Yes, certainly. Well, the red diagonal indicates ISIS, and you can see they dominate most all of northern Iraq northern Iraq, and they extend all the way over the Syrian border. What's in question here is Mount Sinjar. They absolutely control everything around that, all the routes leading to the Mosul Dam up here in the north, and also extending all the way over to Kurdistan. And Erbil is, is in question in where the airstrikes are supporting. So, so where are the U.S. airstrikes so far, and what have they been able to accomplish? Sure. Friday night, the airstrikes went in here in the vicinity of Erbil to to stop any potential assault on Erbil. They were targeting mortars, artillery, etc. And the last two airstrikes on Saturday and also today are taking place in the vicinity of Mount Sinjar for the same reason. We're targeting ISIS capability on the ground, artillery, mortars, maneuver capability, truck convoys, etc. But, but at this point, we're just taking out individual artillery pieces or convoys or mortars. I mean, this is not any kind of a concerted air campaign. No, that's a critical point. This is a defensive air strike campaign, largely designed to protect Erbil, U.S. presence, and protect certainly the refugees at Mount Sinjar. It is not taking away ISIS freedom of movement or its initiative. So you can understand, there are five attacks taking place as we speak right now 
by ISIS. They have total initiative and total freedom of movement. In Kirkuk, they're to conducting two attacks north of Baghdad, which is here, 80 miles to the north in Tikrit, in this area here, 20, 20 miles to the north in Mossad. They were also conducting an attack about 25 miles south of Baghdad in Yusufiyah, and they're attempting to seize the Haditha Dam here in Ambar province, which is very important to them. So they have freedom of movement and they have the initiative except in the area of Erbil and at Mount Sinjar. So, so just to button this up, are we rolling back ISIS or are we just containing them in very limited areas? We are containing them in very limited areas. To change the nature of this campaign, the president would have to change the orders to the military. That would mean offensive campaign designed to destroy command and control, logistics and maneuver units. And the operation would change in terms of scale. It would then begin to attack ISIS in multiple locations at the same time. And we're not doing that now. General Keene, thank you so much. Now let's get reaction to the new U.S. role in Iraq from two key senators. First, Republican Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, a member of the Armed Services Committee. Senator, after President Obama declared his new policy of airstrikes and humanitarian airdrops, you sent out this tweet. Let's put it up on the screen. The actions announced tonight will not turn the tide of battle. But President Obama says we can't do that. We can't roll back, I just take the offensive measures that General King was talking about until we get an inclusive government in Baghdad so that all of the factions in that country are, are joining in the fight. Well, that's not accurate. When I, when I look at the map that, that General King described, I think of the United States. I think of an American city in flames because of the terrorist uh, ability to operate in Syria and Iraq. The Director of National Security, the FBI Director, the Director of Homeland Security has said that the ISIS presence in Syria where hundreds of Americans and thousands of European fighters have, have gone, represents a direct threat to the United States. And now their enclave in Iraq. So, Mr. President, you have never once spoken directly to the American people about the threat we face from being attacked from Syria, now Iraq. What is your strategy, strategy to stop these people from attacking the homeland? They've expressed a desire to do so. So there's no political reconciliation in Baghdad going to protect the American homeland. That has to be a commander-in-chief with a strategy and a vision. This commander-in-chief has no strategy. He has no vision. Uh, this is a situation of where he knows better than everybody else. He was told, you should get engaged in Syria three years ago by his national security team. He said no. His military commander said you should leave troops in Iraq as an insurance policy, and he got to know. So what do you think we're accomplishing with these very targeted, very limited airstrikes against, as I say, an individual artillery piece in Erbil or uh, a, a, a specific vehicle outside Mount Sinjar? A bad news story. He's trying to avoid a bad news story on his watch. This is not a replacement for a strategy, strategy to deal with an existential threat to the homeland. To every member of Congress, You've been told by every major intelligence leader in our nation that we're threatened, the homeland is threatened by the presence of ISIL in Iraq and Syria. To change that threat, we have to have a sustained air campaign in Syria and Iraq. We need to go on offense. There is no force within the Mideast that can neutralize or contain or destroy ISIS without at least American air power. Mr. President, be honest with the American people about the threats we face to the members of Congress who say, stop. What is your alternative if we stop to protecting the homeland? But after getting all the U.S. troops out of Iraq back in 2011, the president made it very clear on Thursday when he announced it and again yesterday before he went to Martha's Vineyard, we are not getting back into another war, another full-out campaign in Iraq. Take a look. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not allow the United States to be dragged into fighting another war in Iraq. And so even as we support Iraqis as they take the fight to these terrorists, there is no American military solution to the larger crisis in Iraq. Senator Graham, are you saying we should go back to war in Iraq? I'm saying that Iraq and Syria combined represent a direct threat to our homeland. The day the president uh, raised his right hand to become president for a second time, his constitutional responsibility as commander-in-chief trumps any political promise. 
What, what is going on in Washington when the FBI director, when the head of national intelligence, the CIA, the Homeland Security Secretary, tells every member of Congress, including the president, we're about to be attacked in a serious way because the threat emanating from Syria and Iraq. His responsibility as president is to defend this nation. If he does not go on the offensive against about Baghdad. This is just not about Syria. It is about our homeland. And if we get attacked because he has no strategy to protect us, then he will have uh, committed a blunder for the ages. But, you know, President Obama likes to say, <laughs> what happens next? What happens the day after? If we go into a full-fledged air campaign against ISIS, as you say, both in Iraq and in Syria, then we're in the middle of two civil wars in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, do we really want to do that? Do we really want to go back full-fledged into these two countries? And, and, and we know how Iraq turned out. That wasn't so great. Do you really want to let America be attacked? You're having people on the ground slaughtering Christians. They have four goals. To make every Muslim bend to their will, to destroy their Christian population in the Mideast, to drive us out and eventually destroy Israel. So here's my statement to the President. Mr. President, your own people are telling you that we face an attack from this region. Your game plan, the actions you're taking, cannot protect us. There is no substitute for America being involved in terms of eradicating ISIS. If we don't hit them in Syria, you'll never solve the problem in Iraq. Three years ago, Mr. President, you were told by your national security team, get involved, arm the rebels, because this problem will grow. You said no. You made many, many bad bets. Your, your strategy is failing. You told us bin Laden's dead, we're safe. Since bin Laden has died, there are more terrorist organizations with more safe havens, with more money, with more weapons and more capabilities to attack the homeland than there was before 9-11. Mr. President, if you don't adjust your strategy, these people are coming here. President Obama bristled Saturday when he was asked uh, about the fact that he had pulled all U.S. troops out and was that responsible for the spread of ISIS. He said, look, it was Iraq that didn't want to make the deal for a carry-on status of forces agreement. Take a look at what the president said. That entire analysis is bogus uh, and is wrong, uh, but gets frequently peddled around here uh, by folks uh, who uh, oftentimes are, are trying to defend previous uh, policies that they themselves made. Question, is that a bogus argument by people who were wrong about Iraq in the first place? I suspect he would suggest you. The president, yes, and I'm telling the president, you're rewriting history at your own convenience. You got the answer you wanted. You promised to get us out of Iraq, and you were hell-bent to get out of Iraq. And when everybody told you you need to leave a force behind, you made it impossible for the Iraqis to say yes. Mr. President, you authored us getting out of Iraq. And during the debate with uh, uh, Governor Romney, Governor Romney suggested I could support 10,000 troops like the president intends to leave behind. And the president said in that debate, I'm not leaving any troops behind. I'm not going to get entangled in Iraq yet again. Mr. President, you're rewriting history. Senator Graham, thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Now, let's bring in Democratic Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland, who sits on the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Senator Cardin, you just heard Senator Graham and his very strong opinions. What's your reaction? I have a great deal of respect for Senator Graham. I just disagree with him. I agree with the president. There is not a U.S. military s solution to this issue. We have a very limited mission that the president is authorized to deal with the humanitarian crisis to avoid a genocide, and I, I support that mission. We're protecting U.S. interests as far as uh, the safety of U.S. personnel in uh, the northern part of, uh, of Iraq. That's our limited mission, but we're not going to use our military to take care of what the Iraqis should be taking care of. And if you're looking at what the real cause here, the real cause is that the Iraqi government has not uh, performed the way it should to protect the rights of all Iraqis. We are not going to get in the middle of, of, of a civil war and use American military where it should be Iraqis taking care of their own needs. I'm going to get to the threat of ISIS in a moment, but when you have reservations about our getting involved at all, I know. And in fact, back in May, you joined a number of other senators uh, seeking to repeal the authorization of the use of military force, which was the resolution that allowed the invasion of Iraq in 2003 in the first place. Is President Obama, from what you've heard, is he getting too far involved in this? And when you hear him talk about this being a long-term project that could take months, 
Are you concerned about this becoming an open-ended commitment? Well, I, I disagreed with our uh, invasion of Iraq uh, 13 years ago. I didn't think there was a military need at that point, that, it was, that Iraq was not a direct uh, danger to the United States. I support the President's limited mission here. We have a potential genocide that could take place where the United States, at the request of Iraq, can do something about it, working with the international community. I think we're right to take action. So I support this humanitarian issue. I think we've got to be very careful that we're not drawn in to the use of our military in a civil war taking place in Iraq. Now, the, the president is talking about getting drawn in if you get an inclusive government in Baghdad, if Maliki steps down and you get buy-in from the Shiites and the Kurds and the Sunnis. Uh, one, would you support that? And two, what do you make of the fact that they were supposed to, by the Constitution, the parliament was supposed to meet today to pr choose a prime minister, and they couldn't even agree to do that. Well, no, I'm not. Gonna, I would not support drawing American troops in to do what the Iraqis have to do for themselves. I would oppose that. I do support this humanitarian mission. I think the president's right. The Iraqis uh, look at America as being able to help prevent a genocide, and we should do that. Working with the international community, we have a game plan in, in that regard. What we will not do is become the Iraqi Air Force, as the president has said. And uh, obviously, we've got to be extremely concerned that we're not drawn into that type of, of military action. Yeah, but, but now let's get to the point that Senator Graham raised, and that is what about ISIS? You've got this group that is even more radical, even more deadly than al-Qaeda. They have established a safe haven, what they would call a caliphate, in the heart of the Middle East, all the way from northwestern Syria, all the way into central Iraq. Are you not concerned that they could become a major threat to, the, to first the region and eventually to the U.S. homeland? I'm very concerned about all these extremist groups that believe that it's their way and everyone has to conform to their beliefs and have no uh, respect for people who have different views. Absolutely, I'm very concerned about ISIS and their uh, impact in that region. And the United States, working with the international community, needs to contain and hopefully eliminate that type of extremist. The way to do it is first and foremost to have a re representative government in Iraq so that moderate Sunnis don't find that, that the only course they have is to line up with extremist groups. So let's have a representative government that can reach out to the moderate community and cut off the support for the extremists. But what about the role of the U.S.? You, do you really think that we're going to roll back ISIS without a, a muscular U.S. air presence? I think that what we need to do is make sure the Iraqis do everything we can that the Iraqis go fulfill their commitment for a representative government to work first with the moderate Sunnis so that we can try to eliminate some of the support groups that are working now to help ISIS. But, but sir, you're not that, answering, sir, if I may, you're not answering my question, which is, is there a role for the U.S. Air Force, for the military, airstrikes to take out ISIS? I don't think we can uh, take out ISIS from a military point of view from the use of our airstrikes. That's not going to uh, solve the, the problem. The fundamental problem is whether the Iraqis believe that they have a representative government so that Sunnis feel comfortable with the government in, in Baghdad. I think that's going to be the, the key to cutting off the type of permanent support that ISIS uh, could otherwise have. Senator Cardin, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Always a pleasure to talk with you, sir. Thank you. Up next, President Obama has set strict limits on the U.S. air campaign in Iraq. Our Sunday panel joins the debate about what it will accomplish. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we may use your question on the air. This program is proudly lid on problems. It can only last if the people in these countries themselves are able to arrive at uh, the kinds of political accommodations and compromise uh, that uh, any civilized society requires. After authorizing airstrikes in Iraq, President Obama offers a broader insight into his thinking about what U.S. power can accomplish, and we're back now with the panel. George, what have you learned? this week, if anything, about Obama foreign policy, about his very grudging willingness to use force and the very strict limits he puts on it. I think we learned three things from his extraordinarily and alarmingly revealing interview with the New York Times. First, he said he wants a settlement 
in the Middle East, but in Iraq particularly, where there are no victors and no vanquished. Now, ISIL is not in the realm of splittable differences. They cut people's heads off. They say that the Yazidi have to be exterminated because they're devil worshippers. It's very hard to have a no victors, no vanquished relationship with people like this. Second, he said, we have a strategic interest in pushing back ISIL. Back to where? It's not as though they emanated from some state and are occupying another state. They're home now. And we're certainly not going to push them back with air power. One of the consistent themes of our military experience of the last hundred years is the limitations of air power, no matter how spectacular some of its effects can be. Finally, he said, and this is related, about Russia, he says, we want to go back to a cooperative relationship with Russia. Again, no talk about Russia giving back to Crimea. So again, it's a conceding the advances that our enemies have made and trying to be nice to them. As George pointed out, the president did an interview with uh, Tom Friedman, columnist for the New York Times, which was very interesting and very wide-ranging. Uh, in, in that interview, he said his, perhaps his biggest foreign policy regret was in Libya, that, that we got involved in toppling Gaddafi but didn't have a good answer for what happened next. Take a look at this clip from the president's interview. I think we underestimated, our European partners underestimated, the need to come in full force if you're going to do this. Then it's the day after Gaddafi's gone. So that's a lesson that I now apply every time I ask the question, should we intervene militarily? Do we have an answer the day after? Jackie, is that sensible caution or is that paralysis by analysis? Well, I think he just made Ron's point. I, I think that's exactly what he said. That they, he's underestimated, uh, you know, in, uh, underestimated in Libya. I think one of the interesting things is, is that the president has largely followed what the American people want on this. They don't want intervention. And yet his polling on foreign policy used to be a huge victory for him. Now it's not. Now it's down low with Obamacare. And it's just striking. They still don't like what he's doing. You know, Laura, this is not George W. Bush. It's not Ronald Reagan. This is a president who is, is very cautious about the use of military force after all the problems of the last decade or so, is that a bad thing? Well, he ran on getting us out of Iraq and on the tales of public dissatisfaction with the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he won on the fact that he was historic, and he, he's obligated, he feels, to follow down that path. The problem is reality comes and hits you in the face. And I think Mitt Romney said during the campaign that uh, it's like almost like the president uh, is managing our decline, our economic decline of the middle class, uh, refusal to really engage with Republicans uh, on a lot of issues. And now it seems like that management of our decline has now really seeped into our foreign policy, where with Putin, someone like Putin, I have a great interest in Russia, and uh, that Putin moves into Ukraine, and we're, we're very slow-footed to react. We have some of these sanctions. Sanctions mean nothing. The Europeans have the Nord Stream, the South Stream pipeline going into Europe. That is critical to the lifeblood of Europe. You're never going to get strong sanctions from Europe as long as European leaders know they have to rely on those energy sources. The president doesn't have that strong muscle to go in in Europe and say, look, we need you to do this with us. We have a strategic interest in rolling back Russia. We can't just manage our decline with Russia. We can't just say we're going to sit down with Putin and everything's going to be okay. We have to show unity of strength, at least among our allies. But now that's gone away. In the New York Times interview, uh, the president does talk about Putin and Russia and Ukraine, and, and he says this. At one point, he says he could invade, I'm almost sounding like he's a bystander watching a train wreck happen. Uh, your thoughts about presidential strength and weakness and, and the use of force and the willingness to use it? Because sometimes, if I may, as somebody who covered Ronald Reagan for six years, sometimes, well, to use his line, peace through strength. Sometimes you get more peace if people think that you are willing to use force, and if you do, in fact, do it on occasion. If someone who covered Bill Clinton and George Bush, I'll say the American people um, don't want intervention. But the American people also don't want weakness, and they don't want to be attacked. Um, he does have to deal with the world as we have it, not the world as we want it. Three things about that interview struck me. One, you just put up there. He's going to invade? Well, yeah, it's a pretty big deal, Mr. President. What's the next sentence? Two, um, he, he, the comment about no victors and no vanquished. That's a funny thing for a president to say who's overseeing a political system that's all about, you know, uh, they can't get over the... He didn't no take that approach vanquish. in the campaign. Exactly. The White House is all about victors and vanquish, yeah. so are Republicans for that matter. Talk that's a problem. That's a different issue. Also, Tom's, I thought it was a wonderful interview, but Tom's lead said um, that the president had... Uh, it's clear that the president has a take on the world. 
I read that story three or four times. I can't find the president's take on the world. And that, I think, is a problem the American public has right now. That shows weakness. If you can't, let us know what is going on and where you're taking us and how you're going to protect us from this new threat. Thank you, panel. See you next Sunday. So what do you think? Should the U.S. go back into Iraq? Not just look away. That's not who we are. We're Americans. We act. We lead. Less than three years after declaring the Iraq War over, President Obama justifies the U.S. going back in at least to block ISIS from taking over more territory. And it's time now for our Sunday group. Syndicated columnist George Will, Jackie Kucinich of the Washington Post, radio talk show host Laura Ingram, and Ron Fournier from the National Journal. George, what do you think of the air campaign that the president launched this week? And to pick up on the phrase he used there, is this a case of America acting and leading? He's now the fourth consecutive U.S. president to engage militarily with Iraq. And this time the question is, what is the mission? If the mission is simply to protect the Kurds and others, then that's one thing. We are actually obligated under the Genocide Convention, which is right here, and which Ronald Reagan signed the implementation legislation of in 1988. To, it says genocide is a crime under international law, which they, the signatories, undertake to prevent and to punish. So there's this kind of statutory reason for this. On the other hand, that seems to concede the advances that ISIL has made. That is, there's no talk really about getting rid of their conquest of territory up there. I don't know about you, I was very struck by Jack Keane saying that ISIL is now attacking south of Baghdad. Now that means they've got them surrounded. And it means, A, what's left of the Iraqi state. The president says much depends on what we do on there being an inclusive government in Baghdad. And while he's engineering an inclusive government in Baghdad, the writ of that Baghdad government doesn't seem to run much beyond the suburbs of Baghdad. We asked you for questions for the panel, and we got this on Facebook from Bruce Stoltz. He writes, I'm happy that we are helping those on the mountain, but to think that limited military strikes are going to make a difference is silly. You go in to win or, you, or don't go in at all. Jackie, I mean, that seems to be, and we heard this in the debate between Senators Cardin and, and Senator Graham, what's our mission there? Is it too much? Is it too little? How do you answer, Bruce? I think it's striking that there's no end date to these strikes, that the president, it was kind of vague, and I think that was on purpose, so they could potentially expand this later. I also think Benghazi is looming very large here. I think, uh, particularly with the American consulate in Erbil, if that falls, then they have a humanitarian crisis that's even bigger, and the uh, problem of getting personnel out. So uh, there are a lot of things, um, that it, it makes sense what their administration is doing right now. As far as putting boots on the ground, the president's hand was forced even starting these airstrikes, I, I think. Uh, I don't think he really wanted to go into Iraq again. So this, this is a first step. We'll see what happens. Well, Laura, it was clear to anybody who was watching on Thursday night that this president really didn't want to do what he was doing, really didn't want to go back into a combat situation, even from the air, uh, in, in Iraq, wasn't happy about doing it, and was trying to come up with a very carefully calibrated, limited policy. How did he do I think it's really hard. I, I don't think you can judge how we did right now. I mean, it's, it's, we're almost in an impossible situation, right? The American people really have no appetite for America to re-engage. They, they didn't want us to go into Syria. Obama did want to go into Syria. That red line was crossed. We couldn't go in. The American people said no. The British people said no. Uh, after Iraq and Af Afghanistan, our own country, you know, middle class struggling, people are, uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to accomplish? So I think he, he's trying to, he's reacting to that, but he also, as the Washington Post pointed out yesterday, he's now, I think, reluctantly seeing the perils of inaction. If we do nothing here, then what? I mean, let's say Iraq does fall, which I think is a possibility. Iraq may fall if indeed there are no boots on the ground, not going to happen, can't happen. That's very em empowering to ISIL, right? If they know American troops are not going to be on the ground at all, and I'm not saying I want them there, then they know they get an artillery position hit, as they did yesterday, and then they flood back in, which is what happened yesterday. They have that hydroelectric dam right now. If ISIL decides to flood, uh, much of uh, southern Baghdad go, can reach all the way to Baghdad. That in and of itself would be devastating. And we should also remember about 3 million Christians lived in Iraq in peace. Uh, we're talking about the Yazidis. They need help. They're desperate, desperate in, uh, in need of help. Christians have been suffering in Iraq for several years now. 
And I think our government, even the Bush government, hasn't done enough to protect those religious minorities as well. So this, is, this inattention to what's happening on the ground in Iraq has been going on for some time. I don't know if there's a good solution right now, which is a horrible thing to say for the United States of America. Ron, as, as I pointed out with General Keene, we are literally hitting one artillery piece, one convoy at a time. Does it make sense to have such a limited mission, such a limited role, or should we either be doing more or should we either be doing less? I don't know. I think we're missing the big question here. First, uh, it's hard to admit this, but our country was uh, not honest about how it got into Iraq and not smart about how it got out of Iraq. We can't do anything about the former, so let's talk about the latter. I think, as you say, the president is doing what most of the Americans want right now, something very limited. Let's save those people on the mountain. Let's save our people on the ground, something, something that's very strategic. The problem is this is a very ruthless, strategic, well-funded group of terrorists. I even hate to say the word group of terrorists. It's a state. A, a state. It's got a wants, government. It's wants, got an army. Its only mission is to take us out. We are going to get hit. They, were, they are coming after us, and we are going to get hit if we don't figure out how to stop them. So short term, yes, the president's doing fine. Long term, look, this is a, a president who underestimated ISA. He called them JV. He underestimated what was going to happen after Libya. He said that in the New York Times article. He underestimated what Putin. He underestimated uh, several other areas. He's been the commander in chief or the underestimator in chief. So I don't want him to underestimate. We can't afford the president to underestimate this threat. I also don't want him to overreact. We've done that before, and it kind of got us into this mess. So you're right. It's an awfully tough thing to do. I wish I was more confident that the president really understood the threat to our homeland. Um, you heard Lindsey Graham, George. How do you respond to him when he says, look, forget about political reconciliation in Baghdad. We have our own national security interest. And the fact is, if, if, if you establish this caliphate, and that's what they say they are, they don't call themselves ISIS or ISIL anymore. They call themselves the Islamic State. They say they've already created a state. If you establish that in the heart of the Middle East, we are going to bemoan that for decades, the way that we bemoan what happened with, with uh, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We have fought for 13 years, the longest war in our history in Afghanistan. Why? Because we said it is in our national interest not to have a large area that is a safe haven in which terrorists can plot attacks against us. Iraq now, after eight years of war in Iraq, 2001 to 2011, is becoming exactly what we went into Afghanistan to prevent. Remember Colin Powell's pottery barn rule, if you break it, you own it. We've broken two states in the Middle East. We broke by our policy the state of Libya. We broke by our policy the, the state in Iraq, and we own the rubble. So when we own the rubble, does that mean we have a responsibility for fixing it? We, no, we have a responsibility to learn the lesson at long last that we can't fix states like this. Let me put it this way, 13 years no. ago, almost exactly to this day, President Bush got a memo saying al-Qaeda wants to attack America. We have just gotten the memo. And That's also, what's happening right now. We learned, memo about the next attack. And we learned uh, yesterday, today, more details about how al-Qaeda is kind of disintegrating right into the Islamic State. So al-Qaeda has become the Islamic State. So George is right. I think it, we, we, we try to do all these things in Iraq. Now Iraq is, is, is worse off. I mean, I, mean I, hate, I hate to say that, but Iraq is worse than before we went into Iraq. Christians are gone. Uh, there's no sense of order at all. Saddam Hussein is gone. That's a good thing. But what's left? a more emboldened Islamic State, not contained, apparently, even by U.S. airstrikes. All right. Right. All right. We have to take a break here, but we're going to continue the conversation. Up next, the situation in Iraq. Trenchant. This is done under the fair use standards of uh, providing opinion on uh, media. So that, that ends my legal disclaimer on to the program information from Fox News Sunday about the Iraq situation and related topics. Thanks a lot.